Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I am the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity Smart Data webinar series with host Adrian Bowles. Today, Adrian will be discussing getting started with streaming analytics and in the and the Internet of Things. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag smart data. If you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right for that feature. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our series speaker for today, Adrian Bowles. Adrian is an industrial analyst and recovering academic, I love that, providing research and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging emerging technology markets. He cover, his coverage areas include cognitive computing, big data analytics, the Internet of Things, and cloud computing. Adrian co-authored Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics, published by Wiley in 2015, and is currently writing a book on the business and societal impact of these emerging technologies. Adrian earned his Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology and a Master's in Computer Science from SU and Y Binghamton, and his PhD in Computer Science from Northwestern University. And with that, I will give the floor to Adrian to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Great. Thank you, Shannon. It's, uh... I think this is the first time that you've introduced me as the host and not as the new host. So I, I guess I'm settling into the role after four months, you know. Well, uh, thanks everybody for joining us here. This is this is terrific. Uh, before we started the call, I was saying to Shannon that it was kind of interesting. In the first three months, uh, we've had people from over 40 countries join us on these um, on this series. So wherever you are today, uh, tonight. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'm not sure which time zones we're covering, but uh, welcome to everybody. Today we're going to talk uh, about getting started with streaming analytics in the IoT. And if I can, oops, this is the first time we've done this with uh, presenting from my computer. Ah, there we go. So, uh, we're what I'm going to do is give you a little background, some context on why this is important, uh, new data sources, et cetera. Uh, then a little background on streaming analytics in terms of uh, what we're talking about and what we consider to be streaming and, and what isn't streaming. Uh, an overview of the importance of open source data and open source uh, tools in terms of building these applications. And then I want to spend some time looking at what the vendors are really doing uh, in this area, because there's a lot of hype, but there's also some real value being delivered. So it's a pretty exciting, exciting time uh, to be working with analytics and the IoT. So let's get right into it and start with uh, new data and new demands. Those of you that have uh, been with us since the beginning, when we started the series in January, um, I used this slide once before to talk about the, the fact that we're going to be covering the uh, Internet of Things. Uh, and you'll hear me talk about the Internet or the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything almost interchangeably because that's where the world is going. And the, uh, the picture on the left, uh, uh, that's actually me interviewing John Bates, who's the CEO of Plat1. And Plat1 is going to come up later in the talk as one of the, uh, the vendors to watch in this space. But I think the, the quote here will kind of set the, uh, set the stage. So Internet of Things is, uh, is often referred to now as uh, the beginning of the new, the new industrial revolution. And I don't think that that's overstating it. What we're talking about is really a level of connectivity uh, that we've had in science fiction, but we've never had uh, in reality in the past. And this goes, for me, back to the late 90s. Um, Shannon mentioned that I'm a recovering academic. In the late 90s, I was teaching in the business school at NYU. Uh, and one of the things I talked about was the importance of getting everything that creates data or about which we would want data online so that we can start to take advantage uh, of understanding things and not just people. So the Internet moves from being a 
pure communication device to being a connectivity device. So with that in mind, we'll look real briefly at uh, these terms, Internet of Things, Internet of Everything. Once we get to the point that everything is connected, we're going to see new sources of data. We're already seeing that. We're going to see a lot of examples today. But the important thing for businesses is that there are new sources of value from data that was already there that we really couldn't uh, leverage in the past. And we have to start looking at things and changing our assumptions about what we should measure, whether we should be uh, uh, sampling data or actually going in and looking at everything. This is something that uh, we'll go get into today. We also have to change our assumptions about who owns data and what you need to do to communicate and to improve relations with your business's uh, clients, your uh, supply chain, regulators, uh, basically everybody that you communicate with. So the IoT, the Internet of Things, and you know, I want to say, I still think of it as the Internet because uh, basically we're, we're layering on top of the Internet. Now we'll talk about the industrial Internet. But we're having, we're seeing already new technologies, new business models, and what I'll look at today is some of the new ecosystems, because I think that's pretty exciting. Uh, this just happens to be a, a news story from uh, a couple of months ago, Qualcomm buying a chip designer to tool up for the Internet of Everything. Qualcomm, of course, uh, we've mentioned a couple of times in our talks about uh, cognitive computing, because they're one of the first companies that uh, really made an investment in neuromorphic chips for uh, machine learning. Now we're seeing this sort of second line, and it all comes together. We'll, uh, we'll talk probably at the end about how we are seeing this convergence between the Internet of Things, analytics, cognitive computing. It's all coming together to change the way um, we interact with each other in society, but also the way businesses interact with each other and also with their consumers. So what we'll see as we get into the examples uh, is that once we do have uh, data coming from a lot of new sources, uh, very high volume data, and I'll try and define that in a minute, we also have to look at where do we put the intelligence in our systems. And just as we'll see, uh, you know, sort of a, a migration or a shift over the years from uh, putting data in one place and operating on it in that place and then moving it somewhere else, uh, to what we have today where the operations on data tend to follow the data or to, um, to migrate to the data, it's the same thing with intelligence. And there's a real uh, movement afoot to make uh, all the devices, either the devices themselves intelligent or to have what we think of as um, intelligent machine learning components that are leveraging all the data that's coming from these senses, sensors, sorry. Uh, sensors and sensors, that, that's a uh, topic that's coming up in another month or two. But let's start um, today looking at the new data that's available and how that's changing the demands, but also how it's creating new opportunities. So uh, I thought this would be interesting to start with. Uh, for comparison, Gartner, and this is uh, in November, Gartner said that uh, by 2020, there will be 21 billion IoT devices, which is cool, except uh, they had to be one upped by Business Insider, which said by 2020, there will be 34 billion devices. The truth is, I have no idea how many devices there will be uh, by 2020. But if I look at the, um, the expansion in the number of things that are being added to the net uh, and that are discoverable, uh, I wouldn't count out um, certainly even the higher of these two estimates. We could be uh, we could be way low because as you start to put things on, it's like uh, the the network um, rule. If you think about it, having one telephone didn't do much good, but that second one got a lot of calls from the first one. Once you have a network effect with millions or billions of devices, and they can talk to each other and create some value from those interactions, uh, then the rate of expansion is going to go up. And so 
This was merely to show that uh, we don't know how many there are, but there are going to be a lot. And if you look at your own environment, the type of uh, folks, the job titles of people that, uh, that register for these webinars, I would assume that most of you already have uh, at least half a dozen devices that are on the internet, whether it's your computer, your smartphone, uh, your tablet, uh, your um, personal exercise thing, like a Fitbit that's communicating um, with your system. We're getting to the point now where uh, early adopters, at least, it's not unusual to have all these things going at once and communicating. As we start to get um, more personal devices and your refrigerator connected to everything else, uh, these numbers are going to start to look uh, quite reasonable very soon. So more demand. Uh, YouTube. Uh, I do a lot of work where we post videos on YouTube, but it's still amazing to me that every minute uh, of every day, YouTube is getting over 400 hours of content uploaded. And if you start to look at what the uh, the data rate is on that, you know, depending on whether you're doing uh, low or high um, resolution video, you're talking gigabytes up to uh, terabytes for individuals, and certainly into the, the petabytes and probably exabyte for um, for YouTube. Now, you start to look at all the other places that are collecting this data, and we'll see where there's some interesting opportunities for companies and even individuals to leverage that onslaught, if you will. So here's one. Um, General Electric, which is uh, a hot topic. I happen to be in Connecticut about uh, 10, maybe 10 minutes away from GE's world headquarters, which is now moving out of Connecticut. But they have uh, done a lot with the industrial internet, and they're going to come up again in a minute. But here's the interesting thing for me is that their data, their locomotive division, uh, the locomotives today have so many sensors that they're computing something on the order of 150,000 data points per minute. If you just stop for a second and think, 150,000 data points per minute, is that something where you're going to use all of that information? Are you going to sample it? Are you going to abstract it out? Are you going to save it until the train stops and then download it and, uh, and use it? Well, those are all questions that need to be addressed. Uh, and the fact that we can compute or can um, generate uh, 150,000 data points per minute uh, on a train that's going across country, does that mean that uh, those things are all relevant? And that's going to be part of the uh, what we come to at the end in terms of deciding what to use and how to use it. So this is um, something I, th I think is just a orders of magnitude change uh, in data processing and IT from what we had just a few years ago. Uh, I wanted to <clears throat> to note that most of the examples or many of the examples that we use today are from uh, commercial ventures like GE and some of the others, but there's a movement right now uh, that's been picking up steam to make uh, government data or data collected by the government open and available to the public. And what that means uh, in the case of uh, New York City's open data uh, initiative and open data portal is that with very few exceptions, data that the city collects and this is done in many places now, uh, is available to the public. And you as an individual can go and get uh, information out of these databases. Typically, they're not um, that user-friendly, but there will be interfaces and APIs so that people can uh, create value by the way they analyze that data. And so that's another, um, another avenue here that's changing the way we think in terms of what are the opportunities. Let me go to one more um, example here from, uh, from entertainment. And most of you are probably familiar with the change in the Netflix business model, for example, over the last several years, going from they would ship you a DVD, and when you were done with it, you would ship it back, and you'd always have something in the mail going back and forth, to on-demand or streaming data, where you're getting the movie, the uh, TV show, whatever it is, as you want to watch it. It's not actually stored on your machine. So we're having to deal with uh, bandwidth issues, but also 
uh, infrastructure issues. So the little diagrams on the left are just showing um, that there are different ways to look at this. If you've got a lot of data that needs to be uh, moved from one point to another, and in the case of Netflix, we're not doing um, analytics on the frames within the video, but there's still that uh, choice that has to be made. Are we sending one copy that's been uh, replicated, or if we're doing something that's uh, on demand like this, we're probably sending a new copy to each of the users. The analytics comes in here uh, when you start to see uh, recommendations. So if you look at um, this one, I think I've uh, <laughs> cropped anything that would indicate which shows uh, I happen to watch or my children watch, but basically uh, the analysis looks at um, what's being streamed, uh, which user, in the case of a family that's using something like Netflix, uh, we have five people that are registered at our house. Uh, I can tell when somebody has signed on with my account and I get a recommendation for something that I would have absolutely no interest in because their algorithms are actually pretty good uh, based on looking at your real history. Uh, one more thing here. Um, I don't know how many of you have uh, reviewed your own uh, data usage recently. I actually created this slide this morning because we're changing cell plans here. I was a little surprised to see that I had personally used uh, Shannon. Did we just lose the screen? Yep, there we go. Uh, that I personally used uh, 29 gigabytes of cellular data in the last eight days. When we think about it, um, that's, uh, that's certainly a lot of data being used because uh, on my phone I'm also doing uh, predominantly on Wi-Fi. So now I have to go in and do a little analysis on uh, how I'm using uh, nearly 30 gig in just over a week. But the interesting thing there from a, an analyst standpoint is that's what I'm using, that's what I'm downloading, but at the same time uh, we could calculate what was being uh, created by the phone as it uh, creates, as it uh, captures data uh, from everything from the accelerometers to uh, the GPS, um, looking at what's being tracked. So I may be downloading uh, nearly 30 gigabytes of other people's data, but the reality is at the same time, I'm creating gigabytes of data, or my phone is creating gigabytes of data about my whereabouts, my behavior, and some of that uh, would be available anonymized uh, to create new value. So the last um, example I want to give before we move on to the next section, uh, you may have seen this one before. This is um, from a site that, that I happen to really like called thingful.net, and this particular uh, snapshot I took, uh, I think, a couple of years ago. Uh, this is a, uh, a search engine that looks at open devices and open meaning that uh, the data is available to the public or the presence is available to the public um, in a number of different categories. And so I happened to zoom in on a hotel where I was giving a talk uh, and found the number of bikes that were uh, actually parked in a bike rack uh, because they have sensors on it at the hotel where I was. And each of these circles represents um, a device. It could be a weather station. It could be a, um, a navigation uh, buoy in the harbor there. But the point is that more and more things are being added to the Internet of Things uh, every day. And our challenge is to figure out which ones are uh, have business potential for us, which ones we can use, and what else we can do to, again, as I say, create that value. So we'll look now at, uh, we'll look at the data itself. Let's look at the idea of streaming analytics as a subcategory of analytics. We've talked about analytics a lot in, um, in this series, but now I want to focus on streaming analytics. And I will say that uh, if you were with us on one of the previous ones where we talked about machine learning, we talked about different types of analytics, uh, predictive analytics, descriptive analytics, uh, and even prescriptive analytics, any of those can be applied 
as streaming analytics. So the, whether something is streaming or not um, is a function of how the data is moving. We'll just go to um, the attributes of a, a streaming nature and see how that fits with uh, streaming data. So uh, <clears throat> you've probably heard the saying that you can't step twice into the same river. I uh, largely interpreted to mean that every time you uh, step, even if it's the same place, it, we're dealing with um, uh, GPS coordinates, you're in the same place, but it's different water. There's different um, things in the context. And so things have changed even if they look the same. And so if we're trying to analyze the contents of a physical stream as it passes through, uh, you have a few choices. Are you going to try and divert the flow so that you can um, measure it and see what's in it and analyze it? Or are you going to pool the data? Uh, pardon the pun, you know, we um, put up a dam and then we can look. And it is interesting to me that we, we use so many um, analogies or, or labels from uh, traveling water to uh, you know, data lakes, et cetera. But uh, every time we, we try and understand what's in this flow, we have to be careful um, that we don't actually change the flow, right, unless that's our intent. I mean, putting up Hoover Dam was certainly uh, had a lot of um, intended side effects, but there's also those unintended. And so it's very difficult to evaluate everything without changing the flow. And when I say ask Heisenberg, I'm not talking about uh, breaking bad. I'm talking, of course, about the uh, uncertainty principle. It's very difficult, uh, if not impossible, to measure everything in your data stream without changing the properties of the stream. So the last um, option there is just to sample what's in there. I think of that as kind of the catch and release. You go in, you look, uh, whatever it is that you've taken out, you put back in. But when we're dealing with um, data, in some ways it is just that simple. In some ways it, it's, it's not anymore. So here, when I look at the evolution of data management, uh, you know, you've got the, uh, I'm not going back to uh, several hundred years, but just uh, in the last century, going from paper card catalogs to early disk drives to, uh, you know, the, uh, the 60s and 70s when we started to actually have real commercial database management systems. And uh, the last one is um, a modern, if you will, uh, graph database. But what they all have in common is we typically perform operations on the data in, at rest. So whether we pull the data into a database and then do our analysis on it, or whether um, we have to, uh, to move some um, analysis or, or query potential to the data, whether you're dealing with things like uh, stored procedures, et cetera, the data itself isn't moving. It's not in transit as you do the analysis. But today, we've got a whole new order of magnitude in terms of speed. And just a couple of examples here. Delta Airlines uh, uh, said so they're processing 5 million business events per day. And a business event for an airline uh, we're talking about uh, transactions, we're talking about um, scheduling, we're talking about uh, personnel, but five million events per day. Pratt & Whitney, uh, related to the data, related to the um, airline industry, of course, Pratt & Whitney jet engine today has typically 5,000 sensors that are producing 10 gigabytes per second per engine while the engine is running. And if you think about that, that's a lot of data, and that's going to uh, come back to this question as we um, as we look at all the different sources. Is that something where you need to be looking at all 10 gigabytes per second per engine for it to have value, or are you looking at pieces of it, or are you looking at the aggregate? Is this something where some of that data you need to know about right away because you're dealing with failure? Uh, some of it, you're looking at it, and it's going to give you information in the aggregate if you compare what's happening right now, what's streaming with the engine that's actually running with historical data. Uh, you can do some pattern matching. You can do some machine learning to predict uh, maintenance. And some of it requires immediate, in, immediate action. Some of it doesn't. 
just to compare the jet engine to uh, a typical Formula One car sensor, a Formula One car uh, has sufficient sensors to produce about 1.2 gigabytes per second. So a jet engine is typically, um, well, it is <clears throat> in one way more complex in one way it's simpler, if you will, than, uh, than a Formula car engine. But the amount of data they're actually capturing uh, is significantly higher for um, for jets today. My little italicized comment at the end is that's all great because we need to be able to look at this stuff, but we're looking at it not only to understand what's happening now, descriptive analytics, if you will, but we want to be able to take that data and use that to predict what's going to happen in the future. And if you're looking at uh, you know 10 gigabytes per second per engine on a multi-engine airplane, uh, there are some things that you're going to predict uh, that you're going to be looking out into the future where you should have a horizon of maybe a week to a month in terms of maintenance that's coming up and others that you need to be looking at in much closer to real time. So we need to look at what the architectures are that will support that. So in, in a nutshell, when I'm talking about streaming data today, I'm talking about data that is high volume and high speed. If it's just high volume, uh, but the speed at which it arrives and the speed at which it needs to be analyzed uh, are not a consideration. I can get all this and I can run it overnight. Maybe I'm looking at um, historical performance uh, of my business. I'm not dealing with real time. Fine. That's not necessarily a streaming data issue. But if the speed at which it's coming in and the speed at which it needs to be analyzed is high, then it could still be um, something that needs to be processed as it passes. And that's really kind of the criteria for streaming analytics. So if I'm uh, building a system to make recommendations for uh, on Amazon, for example, I go on and it'll give me some recommendation. Uh, the performance that uh, that's really required there is a couple of seconds, right? Because if I go on and I go somewhere else, uh, they've lost the opportunity. Now, if we start to layer in uh, geographic data and say, well, I want to make a different offer to you if I know that you're a customer and I have your customer history, I've got all that data, and you're in my retail store, and I can tell based on your cell phone uh, location, which you have opted in at some point, that you are leaving, you're heading out the door, I may want to make a completely different offer, and the timing there is very important. So if you're uh, 10 feet away from my store and you're heading to my store, that's a completely different business proposition than if you're 10 feet away from my store and you're heading away. So let's look at, um, at, at the issue of architecture for a minute. So here I've got a, a, a simple representation uh, of kind of a typical conventional architecture. If I have multiple data sources, You've got data flowing from one place to another. Um, I spent a lot of time in the 80s working with uh, Ed Jordan's company doing data flow diagrams and, and modeling the flow of data through systems. So here, this is like a, a directed graph. You've got the data coming into these circles, which is where some processor transformation happens. And then it goes out and eventually it gets stored or uh, the Two arrows that go nowhere are typical of some systems that I found uh, over the years where data was being produced and it just never went anywhere that, uh, that it could be used again. But the key here is the actual analysis is done when the data is at one of these points along the way. So it's uh, data flowing on the edges and the queries are on the vertices or the, um, the points as opposed to the lines. Now, in a streaming situation, you've still got the data flowing on the edges, but you can have a query anywhere. So the, the think of it as almost like a, um, a fishing net that you stick in that stream and the water's going through, and if something of interest comes by, like a fish, and it gets caught in there, well, then you have actually changed the data, obviously, if you've caught the fish. But just think about this as a query is something that, where the query is stationary and the data is flowing through it. And that comes back to that question I had before, which is, do we, um, do we need to uh, look at every piece of data or do we sample? And uh, 
just make a sort of a side note here. You know, if you've heard the term complex event processing, that's really what we're looking at here. We've got these events and we want to be monitoring and know as something passes in front of us. So to address the sampling question, I'll give you some, uh, an example from a, um, an audio wave. It's, uh, most of us have digital music today in one form or another, whether it's uh, something that you're downloading, you're streaming your music, or you've got it on iTunes, you've got a CD that was actually recorded in digital format. The issue here is if you have um, a signal, and data is really your signal, in this case it happens to be a sine wave, you can see on the left what the wave looks like, right? It happens to uh, go up and down around 440 cycles. Well, the red lines, the red vertical lines, represent where I'm sampling. And if, that was, if that was the sampling interval that I used to look at this data, every time I sample, it happens to be at the high point, at 880. So what you see on the right is, that's what I would think I was looking at. It would be a straight line because every data point that I look at looks the same. As opposed to, if I sample more frequently, then I'm going to get a more realistic um, view of the data. And so there has to be something between uh, not sampling enough, sampling frequently enough to understand what the pattern is that you're finding, and that's, uh, you know, that's easy to do when it's a, uh, a simple sine wave. You know, there's certainly uh, well-known formulas for doing that, like with frequency and all that good stuff. But when you're dealing with data and you don't know what's in there, the issue is, at what point can you be comfortable that you have enough data that you've sampled enough that what's going past you in the stream that you have a good picture of what you need? And I was speaking to someone recently that uh, was doing a uh, sampling of real big data in uh, uh, operational efficiency for IT organizations who so are looking at um, systems in a shop. And the, the manager had said, well, you don't need to look for um, things on a particular port because we've blocked that off. And it turns out that uh, what you think you have and what you actually have could be quite different. So um, in that case, they, they, um, they tried looking at everything and discovered that the policies weren't actually being followed. So as we start to build these systems, it's really important to, um, to make some choices here in terms of sampling versus capturing everything. And although it sounds uh, trite and simple, uh, the, the general rule is capture what you can. You may not use it today. Uh, you may not store it uh, in the end. You may decide to uh, sort of have a trailing window. But the more data that you can capture uh, in a streaming event, uh, the more options you have for analyzing it afterwards. You may analyze it all as it passes through. You may analyze a sample, but uh, keep the record of uh, the rest of it. Those are design choices that we need to look at. So now I'll take a quick look um, at where this fits with um, open source and open data, and just two slides on this. So the first, uh, if you're building a system for um, streaming analytics today, you are almost certainly going to use some um, open source in open source applications, open source uh, system programs in your architecture. And this diagram uh, I happen to borrow from a company called Stream, which is a streaming analytics vendor. Uh, but what I like about it was that it, they've, uh, they've sort of segmented things into open source projects that are useful for data collection versus data delivery and all the different uh, sections in the middle. In an earlier um, webinar, I think it was uh, in February when we talked about machine learning, uh, we talked about the, uh, the Spark and the machine learning libraries uh, for Spark and things like that. So here, uh, the point of this for um, streaming analytics is there are a lot of systems out there uh, most of the, or many of the, uh, the systems that we'll be talking about in the next 10 minutes uh, 
leverage data that's coming in from things like uh, Hadoop uh, that may be organized using um, some of these other um, open source um, projects. But the, the change in the industry right now is how do you take all that data and create new value out of it? Um, the, the benefit of doing um, using an open source uh, infrastructure or architecture, if you will, to actually store it and maneuver or manipulate the data uh, is that these things have, uh, have really built up when you're dealing with something like Hadoop or Kafka or um, Cassandra. You're, you're dealing with something that has a lot of users and there's a lot of progress being made that um, for practical purposes, you're not paying for. Uh, certainly, you know, the, the larger companies are actually investing in that. But with that uh, in mind, as we move from uh, putting all your data in these things that's coming from more traditional sources, you know, you may be putting all your customer data in there, you may be putting all your um, manufacturing data in there. Once we start to say, let's look at it, that we're going to be putting the sensor base or IoT uh, data that's originated from the Internet of Things, then that's a little less mature, and that's why I have this, um, the next slide, looking at um, the Internet, sorry, the Industrial Internet Consortium, which is a uh, recently organized group. It's actually um, managed under the auspices of the OMG, the Object Management Group. But what's interesting here is if you uh, look at what they're doing, it's not really a standards organization, uh, but they are collaborating and coordinating on what's being offered. And I, I think that you'll start to see um, standards that emerge from the group uh, that then go into other places. The IIC is not actually itself um, a standards organization. But the um, original contributors, sorry, the original members that founded it, AT&T, Cisco, GE, Intel, and IBM. Uh, and to some extent, you might think, well, that's the usual suspects if you're dealing with, let's say, Cisco, Intel, and IBM. But then you need to look and say, well, what's the, the GE role or the AT&T role? And obviously, uh, telecoms produces a huge volume of data. Uh, as I described in, in terms of you know, my own usage in you know, the early slide with the um, head of AT&T talking about the importance of the Internet of Things. And GE is now building a platform or has a platform because they have um, turned all of their complex uh, products from locomotives to jet engines, um, et cetera, into sensor-enabled information producing devices and so that really makes sense i uh, just mentioned you know these half a dozen companies the industrial internet consortium today has a couple of hundred companies and i would encourage you to just take a look um, one of the reasons i think that's important is if you're looking at uh, some of the newer vendors some of the smaller vendors the emerging vendors it's good to see if they're actually supporting or participating in some of these uh, organizations so that brings us into the final section where I want to talk about uh, how I'm segmenting the market. One of the things I said when I put the abstract for the talk was that the markets are realigning. And I think there's a couple of things to look at here. The first is the Internet of Things. Um, it, it's very straightforward to create a device and stick it on the net, you get an IP address associated with it. Uh, many of us do that with devices without even thinking about it. But there are a few companies, uh, again, on the left-hand side, the, some of the giants with their uh, their own IoT platforms that they're putting together. And that's why they're uh, so involved in uh, groups like the Industrial Internet Consortium, so they can influence um, what's happening there and how it fits together. So GE, for example, has uh, their predicts, um, that's P-R-E-D-I-X, you know, it's on here, um, solution that is basically the foundation for all of their own applications. But they're using that as a way of communicating with their suppliers and their users. So if you want to build applications, if you're a 
the um, locomotive user and you want to uh, do your own analysis of the data, you would do it going through that platform. Cisco has what they call the Jasper Control Center, um, which is uh, their proprietary uh, system to help their business partners launch services uh, that they know are going to work with, um, with the Cisco environment. IBM um, has made a big investment in both cognitive computing and in the IoT, and now we see it coming together in what they call the Watson IoT. So uh, again, that's another way of interacting as, um, as a, a, um, an application developer where you can build apps that um, interact with these frameworks, these platforms. And AT&T and Intel, um, Intel has uh, what they call the, their developer resources for helping you put your devices on uh, their platform. <coughs> on the right, um, I just wanted to bring up a couple of these uh, smaller vendors or newer vendors. So I think it's interesting to see that uh, it's not all um, the giants. There are a lot of innovation coming from smaller firms. Uh, and I'll mention the middle uh, FT is Flow Things because I don't have a, a slide that goes into their architecture. But they're doing uh, some interesting work in particular with uh, smarter cities and uh, what they call smarter agriculture. One of the examples that I thought was kind of interesting with them is helping a, a cooperative or a collaborative group on Cape Cod uh, where individual um, shell fishermen can use sensors to be able to verify to a restaurant, let's say, that uh, when something was caught and it's put in a, um, a cooler, the, the sensor will uh, monitor where it is and what the temperature was between the time it was caught and the time it's delivered to the restaurant, ensuring freshness that typically a, a sole proprietor uh, you know, out there in, in the clam diggers couldn't do without this type of an infrastructure. C3 uh, is a very interesting company to me. I worked with them when um, they recently renamed themselves C3 IoT. It used to be C3 Energy. It's a company that was founded by Tom Siebel, who um, founded Siebel Systems and X Oracle. They've built a platform, and I put up this um, this diagram because as it turns out where I live in Connecticut uh, about every month we get one of these uh, things and I only recently found out that it was being done from C3 uh, analysis of my utility company's uh, sensors and so this constantly goes on they're constantly monitoring they can provide information to the utility um, in a real-time or near real-time fashion and then they provide information to the utility customer like me uh, on a monthly basis. And I just put it up here because every month I get one of these and it really annoys the, um, <clears throat> it really annoys me because I'm always way worse than the average home. And it probably looks like I'm running a meth lab. I'm actually just running a pair of 27 inch monitors and I've got uh, a lot of teenagers in the house that use a lot of hot water, which runs, uh, runs a lot of power. But this is um, a system that was originally developed for energy monitoring and is now being used for all sorts of different applications where you have a lot of sensors uh, connected to the IoT. And the last one in this category, uh, PLAT1. I mentioned my interview with uh, John Bates earlier. PLAT1 is uh, another internet um, of things device platform to enable the monitoring management uh, of complex systems. I think they've got a couple hundred thousand devices under management right now. I just chose a couple of examples. Uh, they have a version that's uh, being used in smarter cities and another one by utility. So these are two areas that almost everybody gets into if you're doing IoT. All right. So we're going to quickly look, uh, before we open it up to the questions, at the streaming analytics vendors. And here uh, on this slide, I'm really just showing the, uh, again, the giants, uh, as you might expect, for streaming analytics tools. 
uh, and platforms, IBM, Amazon, Microsoft, they're all in there. Uh, and we'll see that they also have uh, something else in common in a second. But companies like SAS and uh, SAP and TIBCO, and Software AG, uh, Informatica, all have um, streaming analytics uh, tools and suites, if you will, that have um, matured as a result of them being in the analytics business before there was a, uh, a real requirement for streaming analytics. What I wanted to um, show with the uh, guys on the left just quickly is that each of them is also focused on offering analytics or streaming analytics for IoT as a service. In an earlier webinar, we talked about uh, machine learning as a service or uh, analytics or insights as a service. These three are um, sort of at the, the top of the pile, if you will, in terms of investment and um, breadth of the suite of services that they're offering. So this one happens to be Microsoft Azure and showing how you can do uh, all sorts of predictive analytics by integrating uh, their tools as a service on demand with your uh, sensor-based devices. This one happens to be Amazon. Again, uh, I chose this just to show that uh, it, it really is, even though Amazon obviously has some uh, proprietary sauce, uh, what you're dealing with in terms of the data management, Hadoop and Spark open source. So it, it all works together these days. And the last one is IBM, in this case, uh, DB2 with Blue. It's the analytics as a service using uh, a platform for one of the major vendors. Now, in this last section, one of the time, just want to talk a little bit about the fact that the, um, the market is very hot right now. And there's some uh, good investment, but also some really interesting results. And I just created here a short list of vendors to watch. There are uh, many more in this space, and we'll be doing a report on this probably around July. Uh, so if anybody's interested in that, please follow up with me uh, afterwards. I'll tell you who we're, we're actually including. But I just wanted to um, mention a few of these uh, because they've taken an interesting approach. So the first one, uh, Stream, is uh, here's their architecture again. It's leveraging a um, an open source uh, data management system, and Stream, uh, the second I in Stream, I guess, is uh, for intelligence. So you're you're looking at the analytics as it passes through, and this is uh, something that we're going to see more and more of. But they've come, the, uh, the stream team comes out of uh, some of the larger firms. It's uh, one where I did an interview with them recently that's, uh, I think, on YouTube at this point. But they've taken a, an interesting approach to integrating this um, static data with the uh, dynamic data or streaming data. Uh, stream Analytics comes from a company um, it's best known as a service, um, large service company called Impetus, and they've commercialized tools that they started to build uh, in their consulting practice. And you can see here, this is just a, an overview of their architecture. I wanted to uh, point out the same thing, that the streaming engine that they build leverages the open source data underneath, or the open source applications, the data in open source, uh, using Apache Storm, which is a and, and Spark, which are the um, the keys that, that we're still dealing with proprietary uh, tools and open source tools um, being well integrated. One more uh, space time insight. The thing that I thought was interesting here, um, we've talked to them recently is that they are very big on um, looking at location data or geospatial data or geospatial attribute for all data. And so you're looking at uh, whether you're dealing with the business data or the operational data, external data source, 
it's looking at the impact of space and time. What I don't have in any of the slides, I, I think this is interesting uh, because obviously uh, most data, uh, there is a time decay, there's a, a time issue to data, but that location uh, is not always factored in. And that reminds me of um, the investment that IBM made with the Weather Channel. A lot of times, the when we see changes in data, if we're not considering the um, weather conditions and where the data is, and where where the and the action is happening that the data represents. So if we're looking at you know, retail data for a store, knowing where that store is and what the weather was at that time really can change the way we um, we look at it. The last one is from a company called Zoom Data. And what I think is really fascinating to me, um, and again, you can look on YouTube. I, I interviewed um, their CEO recently. Zoom has taken an approach to um, modeling and helping to visualize streaming data they use the analogy of a VCR, or a video tape recorder, that you can get access, you can look at something as it's passing through, which is you know, the definition of streaming that we use. You can also go back in time, which uh, many tools do. But what they've done that's uh, quite different is a technique called data sharpening. I was just fascinated by this. So if you're dealing with this high volume of high speed data that we talked about earlier, you can very quickly get a rough look at what's there because they take your query, your, your data, um, your DBMS query, and break it up into what they call micro queries, and they can analyze those separately so that you get a rough picture and then it comes into focus. That's their term when they say data sharpening. It's almost like uh, when you're downloading something. If you ever uh, do your own YouTube videos, when the video first is ready, you can watch it, but you can only watch it in low resolution. And as it gets processed, let's say you shoot something in high def, you can't see it in high def right away, but you can see enough of it in a lower resolution. It's a, it's a good representation of what's there. It's useful, but over time it sharpens and it becomes the final answer. So it kind of pulls these things together. And their technique for that, uh, by partitioning queries into these uh, micro queries, solving the micro queries, and then putting them back together, um, I think that's like one of the cooler technologies that I've seen in uh, in recent years. So we're just running. My time is just about up. I want to say that getting started, uh, like so many of these technologies that we talk about every month, it really is all about the data and to decide whether or not you have an application or that you should be building an application using streaming analytics and IoT. Start by looking at, do you already have or can you capture streaming data uh, from what you're building? So in the case of General Electric, they were able to add sensors to the engines, which created more value for them, but also for their users. Uh, or can you create new value from analysis of open data? There are people out there now that are building systems um, that give you better access to or to the data that's being made available by government agencies, or they're creating new applications, new ways of interpreting that data or combining it. So if you look at uh, population data, which is open to everybody, and then you look at uh, cell phone data and you can add your own sensors in there, you can create something quite new. So my last slide on this is the data is out there. The issue is finding the right data for an application that you can create that's going to add that value. And this just happens to be today's snapshot of my neighborhood. If you knew where I lived, you could find me on the map. And this is showing a variety of sensors that are out there right now from personal weather stations um, <clears throat> to, to actual uh, commercial uh, data that's being produced. And I think that the, the timing is perfect for getting started with streaming analytics and the IoT today. So I'm going to turn it back over to Shannon. Uh, we have a number of um, related webinars coming up over the next few months. 
Uh, just a note here, I, I get a number of um, invitations to connect on LinkedIn. If you found me through uh, one of the webinars, just send me a note and I'll be sure to accept because I get a lot of them that are a little strange and generally ignore those. But if you took the time to, uh, to listen, I would certainly love to connect with you. If you have questions, here's how to reach me. Shannon, back to you. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. Um, and just a reminder to all the attendees that I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording, and anything else requested throughout. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to push them into the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And Adrian, it's so funny that you um, mentioned, you know, that it's, it certainly is not a surprise to me anyway that Cisco and, and AT&T and the telecom companies are, are out there pushing the standards. I know um, I used to work in a, I was a telecom analyst for a call center and we we analyzed over uh, a thousand KPIs <laughs> religiously, <laughs> most of which came from the PBX, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a lot of data that flows through through our telecom systems. And it's so exciting, too, to see this sort of thing not only improve our business. Um, I certainly live uh, on the, the real-time analytics of how our website, the health of our website, and, and what people are reading uh, on a daily basis so I can react and give and uh, provide more content of things that people are truly interested in. Um, but it's so nice that it's bleeding over into our personal lives and I can walk into my house and say, you know, <laughs> turn on the kitchen lights. <laughs> yep. um, yeah. Uh, anything you want to add as to where you see uh, it going? It's, it's so, it's, there's so many possibilities. What's the most, you know, it's just, uh, it's mind boggling and the possibilities of what this technology can bring to the world, especially as you've mentioned, you know, connected with AI and uh, and the other uh, emerging technologies out there. Yeah, you know, I started really looking at this uh, in terms of things being connected um, in 1999. And I was giving examples then that sounded pretty far fetched and we were talking uh, again, this was uh, at NYU, and I said, you know, everybody at that point was just really getting into buying all their books on Amazon, and Amazon ran an experiment uh, where they would let you uh, see uh, attributes of other people who were buying similar books and doing recommendations, but they also did this thing, I forget what it was called, where you could see uh, for a particular um, domain what people were buying from that domain. So you could go on and say, uh, what are people with uh, IBM emails buying in terms of books? Now, obviously, somebody from IBM probably has two or three other email addresses, but you could get some some insights there. And what we talked about is, what are the, the implications and what would you be willing to give up in terms of your privacy uh, if, if you could monetize it? I think you know, even back then, and we're talking about uh, 17 years now, uh, all of the the idea of putting devices on was pretty clear that that's where the world was going to go. Uh, one thing that I didn't see at all, um, I thought of it as, you know, something that would be good for monitoring health. I talked about how... Um, uh, my smart refrigerator could talk to my keychain, which would talk to uh, grocery stores I pass by and would, you know, give me a special offer for uh, for ice cream. But the downside of that is that it would also tell my doctor that I was having it, you know. Um, what I see right now is that the price of getting uh, a device on the web has gone down so much that it, you know, it's not just your expensive refrigerator. It's not just your your laptop. So many tiny things. Your your um, uh, your telephone is obviously on there, but now you have your health related uh, apps and maybe uh, a device, a, a Fitbit or something like that. What I think is going to be interesting is uh, what is the next generation just assume will be online. Because uh, I, I see that with my own kids, you know, they're, they're having something that doesn't talk to anything else is 
just so last century, you know. <laughs> Agreed. Well, we do have a couple questions that have come in here. Uh, we don't have much time left, but I do want to uh, just quickly throw them out there. Um, do you know if, if AT&T is using any particular vendor or streaming, or are they building in-house solutions? Uh, AT&T, that's a good question. I don't know offhand um, what they are saying publicly. I'll Let me see what I can um, – do to answer that, uh, I'll just have to say, no, I can't answer that one right now. <laughs> That's okay. Um, the other question coming in, you know, is how much of the mountains of data is really valuable? A jet engine can generate, you know, gigabytes within minutes of information, but how much of that is valuable, and how much of the data will go into the cloud versus uh, a local gateway? You know, you were kind of talking about this earlier in terms of, you know, whether or not to to uh, sample and everything else, because there is so much data. Right. Yeah. You know, that's. Uh, I never thought about it. I have to make a a good joke between you know jet engines and being in the cloud because um, all that data is actually created while you're above the clouds. But it's um, some of it needs to be uh, sampled immediately, right? There are certain things that you're looking for. Anomalies need to be reported very quickly. Um, I think that for most of these things. I, whatever that number was, 150,000 data points um, or sensors. Uh, there's a reason for collecting it, and you may find that there's data that's collected that's never used, but um, a lot of that is going to be stored for a period of time uh, because later analysis is going to find patterns that you weren't looking for before, and then you can go back and see, see where it fits. You know, in some industries, like in pharmaceuticals, um, I know that the actual uh, researchers' and notebooks have to be kept for a very long period of time after something is is approved to go back, be able to go back and look at it. I think that for um, mechanical devices like this, uh, we're going to come up with at least de facto standards on how long you keep that data. Um, so whether or not it's used immediately. Uh, I think everything that's being recorded is being recorded with the idea that it could be useful uh, as conditions change. I don't know if that, uh, if that has questions. But uh, the other part of the question was um, how much is it will go into the cloud? That, um, you know, more and more of these things are going into the cloud, and the three examples that I gave for analytics as a service are all cloud-based, you know, the uh, – the IBM, um, Amazon, and Microsoft approaches are cloud-based, and uh, so everything that you do is basically you're taking your data uh, in their cloud environment and doing the analysis on it. Um, so the, whatever the percentage is today, uh, I think it's just going to continue to increase. <coughs> All righty. Well, that is all the time that we have for today. Adrian, thank you so much, as always. Just another great presentation. I, I really look forward to these each month. Um, and thanks to our attendees for participating in everything that we do. We just love all the questions that come in. Uh, and I, like Adrian said, we'll see you the next um, – Next month, the second Tuesday of, or excuse me, the second Thursday of each month, where we have the series going. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Cheers.